Alors, nous avons le plaisir aujourd'hui euh, de recevoir Dr. Melissa Hudson pour, euh, les, euh, pour la conférence du département de pédiatrie. Euh, cette conférence-là lance la deuxième édition des journées d'hémato-oncologie de, pédiatrique. Euh, donc, euh, nous sommes très fiers de cette deuxième édition. Donc, nous avons la conférence de Dr. Hudson jusqu'à 13 h Par la suite, à 13h45, euh, la, il y a plusieurs conférences qui sont prévues cet après-midi. Donc, j'invite les gens qui ne sont pas encore inscrits à aller à l'avant. Il est encore possible de s'inscrire pour assister aux conférences. Donc, il y a ceux qui sont inscrits, mais en fait, vous êtes priés de revenir vers 13h30 afin qu'on puisse commencer à temps. Donc, docteur Melissa Hudson est un, une hémato-oncologue pédiatrique qui est à l'hôpital St. Jude pour enfants, donc St. Jude Children Research Hospital, depuis 1989. Elle est la directrice de la clinique de suivi à long terme, ce qu'on appelle le « late effect clinic » à St. Jude. Elle est aussi la fondatrice des guidelines du Children Oncology Group pour le suivi des patients oncologiques. Et également, elle est la cofondatrice des guidelines, des lignes directrices internationales pour les survivants de cancer pédiatrique. Donc, c'est vraiment un leader dans le domaine de l'oncologie pédiatrique. Donc, nous sommes très honorés de l'avoir. Donc, Melissa, it's, we are really happy to have you here. So, thank you for accepting this invitation. Merci, Caroline, and bonjour. I'm so sorry my French precludes me speaking and giving the lecture in French, so please put up with my, <laughs> my English and I'll try to get us through. I really appreciate this opportunity to have a, a, an afternoon session that is focused entirely on pediatric cancer survivorship, and I'm delighted to give the, the kickoff lecture at where I will focus on optimizing health outcomes in childhood cancer survivors. So at the end of the session, I hope that you'll be able to appreciate the prevalence and spectrum of late effects developing after childhood cancer, anticipate challenges to transitioning and implementing optimal survivorship care, identify resources that will help you facilitate high quality survivorship care, and recognize the ideal standards of survivorship care. So I hope that you appreciate that over these last many decades, we have made tremendous progress in, uh, in advancing survival in our pediatric cancer population. And this is data from the SEER registry at, at the NCI that shows the proportion surviving in relation to years from diagnosis over these many decades. And you can see now that with the progress that's been made, we have five-year survival rates exceeding 80% across all diagnostic types. We have almost 380,000 80, individuals living in the United States diagnosed with cancer before the age of 21. And we expect these numbers are going to increase in the U.S. to about 500,000 by 2020. And this gives us the, the statistics of one of every 750 individuals in the United States being a, a survivor of childhood or adolescent cancer. But we know that that experience in childhood cancer really does lead to many health concerns uh, after treatment. Among our younger patients, we're very worried about aspects of growth and development, both intellectual, sexual, physical development. We worry, too, about exposures to all their organ systems you know, at a young age. But also, as our populations are getting older, we're worrying about what is the impact of natural aging on organ system function after these therapeutic uh, exposures that are often quite damaging, damaging to specific organs. We also are concerned about uh, fertility and reproduction, uh, a, an aspect of health that's very important, in particular to our adolescent and young adult survivors, but which we have not consistently and proactively addressed in our survivor populations, and we're seeking to do that as we have more technologies to preserve fertility. Survivors, in addition to being worried about recurrence of their primary cancer, which becomes less and less as the years pass from diagnosis, have to worry as they're getting older and beyond that initial cancer experience about the risk of a spectrum of subsequent neoplasms. And they range from benign to malignant lesions, and among those that are malignant from low grade to very high grade in life-threatening lesions. And it's important, in addition to all these biomedical issues, that we not forget the tremendous psychosocial impact of that cancer diagnosis and experience, and how some of these medical and physical toxicities can impact their subsequent psychosocial uh, uh, functioning, 
their location, their employment, their relationships with individuals, their social competence as young adults. So these are areas of health that we should be considering as we're seeing uh, our uh, long-term survivors and trying to optimize these outcomes. Now, how often do we see these types of health conditions and uh, health complaints in our survivors? And I want to use some data from the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort Study. This is a, a study that we're doing at St. Jude that we have brought back our 10 plus year survivors that range in age from 18 to now 74. But I'm going to show you data from the first 17, 13 survivors that were evaluated on our campus where we brought them back and did a systematic risk-based assessment. It's notable that the median age at diagnosis of this group was six years, median age at study only 32 years, and median time from diagnosis 25 years with a range from 10 to almost 50 years in this population. Okay, so we noticed in looking at the cumulative prevalence of these uh, of, of chronic health conditions that we ascertained and validated that they self-reported that they were validated or we ascertained by uh, clinical examination on campus uh, in relation to age that now we have statistics to indicate that by age 45 we estimate that almost 96 percent will have one or more chronic health conditions and almost 81 percent of those will have a serious disabling or life-threatening chronic health condition. So we know that these are very prevalent in our population. We should be anticipating and remediating and preventing as much as possible. But how does this impact their long-term uh, mortality? And this is data from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, a retrospective cohort study that is now tracking outcomes from 30 cancer centers in North America, but this study that I'm going to illustrate data from was at the time where there were 26 institutions contributing data, over 10,000 survivors contributed to this information, and we see survival function estimates in relation to the years from diagnosis. To enter this cohort, you have to be a five-plus year survivor, and what we have here is the U.S. population mortality rates, which this cohort at this time was in their mid-30s at a uh, median age, and we see what the survivor mortality rate is and you see this big disparity and a, a much higher uh, mortality rate in this in the childhood cancer survivor uh, population and what is contributing to that mortality a 15-fold excess risk of subsequent cancers a seven-fold excess risk of fatal cardiac events and an almost nine-fold excess risk of pulmonary events so we know that these these conditions are not only prevalent but they also impact uh, the, the duration, uh, the lifespan of that survivor, and importantly, we just have not said, oh, this is a terrible thing. This has been the recognition of late effects, our understanding of late effects, and the characteristics of uh, the, the individuals that are at risk for late effects have really been a major stimulus for change in pediatric cancer therapy. So initially in uh, the 70s and 80s, it's just appreciating the physical effects in young children that were developing, the musculoskeletal effects associated with high-dose radiation. Here's an example of a, a, a young child that was treated at eight years of age with the mantle radiation. You see this uh, fibrosis and uh, musculoskeletal uh, hypoplasia in the, the, the treatment field. But even more concerning as our survivor population aging, understanding what's happening with radiation to uh, and chemotherapy, but in these cases I'm giving you examples of radiation to the mediastinum and its impact on cardiac disease and the risk of subsequent cancers such as breast cancer in this population. So we've made lots of changes to avoid these late effects in our survivor population, but we most definitely need to continue to be tracking outcomes and anticipating these late effects for those who receive those treatments to optimize their, uh, their, uh, their cure rates. Now, the focus in therapy, for contemporary therapy, is balancing the cost of cure. And the way we do that is, in addition to considering what treatment is, uh, is needed to achieve and sustain long-term survival, we think about the late uh, effects, the health conditions that persist or develop five or more years from cancer diagnosis, and what can we do to balance uh, the aspect of cure and a sustaining uh, disease-free survival uh, and, and reducing and minimizing as much as possible the late effects. So there is a spectrum now with this change that we see that has changed uh, over uh, the years with our modifications of therapy. In the old days, perhaps we, uh, we saw more uh, life-threatening uh, late effects, treatment-related AML and myelodysplasia, acute and earlier onset cardiomyopathy, pulmonary fibrosis. We don't see that as commonly in the pediatric age range for the majority of the patients that we're tracking, but we sure do see a lot of chronic and life-altering effects, neurocognitive deficits, uh, gonadal dysfunction, 
infertility related to that, seizure disorders, uh, hypothyroidism, other endocrinopathies, a lot of neurosensory uh, deficits and associations with specific therapies, and some survivors will have uh, chronic symptoms too. I think the biggest concern for us considering uh, the change in spectrum that we've seen is now we do see a survivor profile where they appear to be in many cases for vital organ function clinically well. There may be some subclinical organ dysfunction. We know that they'll be dealing with or aging organs, but we see in, within our lifestyles now unhealthy behaviors or not optimal health behaviors to maintain organ function. And we see a collection now of comorbid health conditions that can exacerbate uh, cancer-related toxicity. So our challenge as clinicians managing long-term survivor populations is addressing you know, all these other comorbid and health behavior issues and lifestyle issues that can uh, potentially exacerbate uh, the, the treatment-related toxicities associated with pediatric cancer. And the way we do that is we look at the potential uh, risk for a late effect and we consider what, what uh, factors are contributing to that risk. Host factors such as age at diagnosis, uh, gender or racial uh, 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 issues that may contribute, uh, premorbid conditions that they bring to their cancer experiment, experience, genetic factors that may have contributed to why they develop pediatric cancer or how they metabolize uh, the pediatric cancer uh, uh, treatments that we're providing or how they repair uh, normal organ tissues after uh, exposure and how that may relate to both their acute and long-term toxicities. Uh, the tumor factors such as histology, site, biology, response all directly relate to what treatment is going to be required to get that uh, survivor into long-term remission and maintain that remission. And unfortunately, even uh, with today's therapy that may be fairly limited in some cases, we still have survivors who have critical events that can be uh, uh, traumatic for them long term. You know, strokes are uh, serious infections that uh, lend to morbidity that is lifelong. Uh, again, the big issue that we're learning as these populations are aging is what is the impact of our treatments on aging. And when we see our survivors, you know, at that time point, we can't change any of these other factors, but it's important for them to really appreciate the impact that their health behaviors have on cancer treatment-related toxicities. It's the same types of uh, health behaviors that all of us should be uh, considering and how that may help affect our long-term health, but it's in particular it's important for our, for our survivors to be cognizant that they are more vulnerable in many cases because of their previous cancer experience. So how do we do this effectively? Initially, it's better as we have more access to patients uh, when they're in the pediatric cancer uh, arena uh, at their diagnosis. We're thinking about this. We're considering more, you know, what treatment is needed. How can we risk adapt that treatment? How can we minimize late effects? But what happens is our survivors achieve long-term survival. They are then not being seen very frequently in the cancer center anymore. And that's the critical time for health education, health screening and surveillance, and initiation of risk-reducing interventions. So we have to begin to partner more with our primary care colleagues and find creative ways to stay in contact with our patients, whether it's electronic or mobile health applications that will help us maintain a, uh, an assessment of their health and ongoing communication about health risk. And this is important because when they're in this primary care arena, this is where all these interventions need to be continued to optimize their health and duration of survival and that quality of survival. Now we have challenges as these care transitions are occurring in, trans in transmitting this information to our primary care providers. And let me address some of those challenges. For survivors and families, when they are in oncology and then transition to primary care practices, they may be, in many cases, uninformed about the details of their cancer history. They may not know about those health risks associated with that treatment. And typically, they have a very strong bond with treating clinicians, and they fear transition, and so they want to use preferentially the information from the oncologist and see that oncologist but that oncologist may not be doing an optimal job in really preparing them and addressing these lifestyle issues. Now, oncology providers want to see these long-term survivors. They may not prepare the survivor or the general practitioner for this care transition and what kinds of discussions need to occur, you know, and what kind of monitoring needs to occur long-term. They may not be informed about survivorship care. Oncology is so... Um, focus now that, you know, some individuals may have an expertise in specific diagnostic types or leukemia lymphoma or solid malignancies in neuro-oncology and may not really know a lot of the details about survivorship care and the relationships of treatments to specific health outcomes. 
And the other issue that occurs is when survivors are being seen in uh, the oncology clinics, it still tends to be more about the cancer and is the primary cancer in remission, and not so much about preventative care measures unless they have access to a long-term follow-up program that will address that more systematically. What about primary care providers? They're unfamiliar with survivor health issues. I mean, why should they be familiar? Pediatric cancer comprises numerous and diverse histologic subtypes. Our treatments have been changing, you know, over the last four or five decades. They're constantly evolving. We have new uh, agents that are being introduced. And these primary care providers really have limited incentive to develop expertise because our subtypes are relatively rare in the scheme of things. And this contributes to some discomfort in managing pediatric cancer survivors in the community, particularly if they're very medically complex survivors. So what can we do to facilitate an effective transition and optimize outcomes in our long-term survivor? Uh, the, the survivors need education and anticipatory guidance regarding their cancer history, their cancer-related health risks, the health screening and surveillance recommendations for their specific treatments, the impact of the health behaviors on cancer-related health risks, how to self-manage and uh, the chronic health conditions that they may be experiencing because of their cancer treatment, how to navigate the adult health care system. I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's better here in Canada, but it's, it's a big difference when our survivors leave a pediatric facility going into a, a medical facility and there's not quite as much hand-holding and, and follow-up and phone calling. Uh, they're expected to be responsible adults and take care of themselves. So we need to teach our survivors to be able to advocate for their care and, their, and to manage uh, chronic health issues. And they need resources to maintain access to health care and manage chronic health conditions. So this is a big struggle for us, even in the United States. Despite the new health care laws, we still have many of our survivors who do not have access to optimal care to have the types of... Uh, uh, evaluations that can stay on top of cancer-related health risks. So what I want to do is review uh, some tools uh, that are available to optimize the transition of survivorship care, and these will include a discussion of the cancer treatment summary, the survivorship care plan, evidence-based practice guidelines or a consensus-based guidance if, uh, if the practice guidelines are not available, a comprehensive multidisciplinary care infrastructure, which we call a model of care, and how those models of care can facilitate uh, uh, survivor care and uh, outcomes, and then this care plan that defines the roles of providers within an available model of care. So let's talk first about the cancer treatment summary. This includes information about the cancer histology and the involved sites, the agent diagnosis, which is important to understand how that treatment might impact the development of organs and other uh, treatment toxicities. The specific details of the cancer treatment are important. Surgical procedures, the specific chemotherapeutic agents, radiation treatment fields and doses, blood product transfusions, and uh, whether that child has required hematopoietic cell transplantation to uh, achieve long-term survival. And why do you need this? So if you think about how cancer histology and the sites influence the risk, if you have a four-year-old male with an ALL and an 18-year-old female with left distal femur osteosarcoma, what do they have in common? Nothing. They, have treat, they may have uh, some similar agents that they have been, have been used in their treatment plan, but the approach the individual uh, patient may have is quite different. Similarly, a 14-year-old female with Hodgkin lymphoma involving the mediastinal and axillary lymph nodes will have a completely different treatment plan and spectrum of uh, potential treatment toxicities than a two-year-old male with cerebellar medulloblastoma or a four-month-old female with bilateral retinoblastoma or an 18-month-old male with paratic paratisticular rhabdomyosarcoma, and then consider, oh my goodness, <laughs> then cons I'm, I'm really having a bad time with this pointer, am I not? Then consider the treatment toxicities that occur even with the same type of disease. I'll go back to this. Okay, if you have, and this is not uncommon, we have individuals who have the same uh, cancer diagnosis, a three-year-old male with Wilms tumor or the right kidney and pulmonary mets. Well, that's, even if you thought you knew how a Wilms tumor patient is treated, you may have another one who has a seven-month-old with a, a disease limited to the left kidney. His treatment will be quite different, too. So you have to know these details to be able to anticipate health issues in survivors. 
Now, it, you also should consider that agent diagnosis influences risk. We know in tracking survivors that younger patients are more vulnerable to neurocognitive dysfunction after central nervous system radiation. But some toxicities, a, an older age may put you at higher risk. So here is uh, uh, the, the risk that we see among individual uh, females who have been exposed to alkylating agent chemotherapy or abdominal pelvic radiation that can affect ovarian function because we know that they have the complement of primordial follicles that they're going to have for their lifespan at birth. And we know that when we catch them farther along the reproductive spectrum at older ages, they have a lower complement of primordial follicles and that will put them at a higher risk for, er for earlier menopause. Specific chemotherapy influences risk too. So you can't assume a cancer patient is going to be at risk for the same things. You know, we know there's spectrum, uh, there's toxicity profiles that have been very well characterized. For example, anthracyclines such as doxorubicin, donorubicin have uh, a dose-related risk of cardiomyopathy. We know that glucocorticoids and methotrexate uh, have been linked to bone mineral density deficits as well as other bone, bony toxicities. And bleomycin and busulfan have been linked to pulmonary fibrosis as well as uh, uh, other toxicities. Uh, we know that the dose is important to consider in some of these toxicities. For example, here's data from uh, a COG study that looked at anthracycline-related risk of congestive heart failure. And we can see uh, the odds ratio in relation to the cumulative anthracycline dose and uh, the risk, the odds ratio for anthracycline-related congestive heart failure uh, becomes increased once the dose uh, of uh, 100 is exceeded, and then you see an exponential increase when you reach that threshold dose of 250. So it's very important if we look globally at survivors, this can help us estimate what their risk might be related to a dose exposure. We know that specific radiation fields imp uh, influence risk too, and it's important to know where that treatment field was and the dose of those uh, treatment fields. So for example, cranial radiation, uh, we have to think about cognitive, motor, and sensory deficits based on the areas that were radiated. Uh, we need to think about uh, endocrinopathy potential for any uh, endocrine uh, organs that are included in a radiation field and its potential impact on growth, metabolism, body composition, and reproduction. And the radiation dose is important to consider as well. Here's a childhood cancer survivor study looking at the radiation dose, uh, radiation associated risk of breast cancer. And here we have the odds ratio in relation to the dose to the breast. And we, you can see that there is a linear relationship with increasing dose to the breast with increasing risk. But it was important is a modifier of this risk is ovarian radiation because of its impact on uh, ovarian hormones. So if you had a lower exposure of ovarian radiation uh, uh, here where you maintained ovarian function, your risk was higher than if you had a lower, a higher exposure that was more likely to ablate ovarian function. So you have to think about uh, combinations of therapies and risks uh, in particular as well. Treatment combinations influence the risk of specific outcomes. If we're thinking about chest radiation, uh, which uh, in, has been associated with uh, heart valve disorders and coronary artery disease and cardiomyopathy, we have to consider that some of our combination therapies include chest radiation and anthracyclines, which I've already told you has a dose-related risk of cardiomyopathy, but more often we see now this subclinical left ventricular systolic function. And so here's an example again from uh, a Dutch uh, study that is looking at the cumulative incidence uh, and in relation to time from diagnosis of treatment-related risk of heart failure. And you can see uh, here is the risk associated with mediastinal radiation therapy. Here is the risk of heart failure associated with chemo only uh, with no anthracycline. And here's a risk of mediastinal radiation therapy and anthracycline. So these two modalities that have cardiotoxic potential need to be considered as a higher threat in those individual patients. And the other thing that's important, and we're trying to understand better these profiles in our aging survivors, is the time from exposure. Because some of the toxicities that we see, they're apparent early on in the pediatric age range as that child is completing you know, puberty or, or you know, several years, or even during therapy. So for example, uh, agents like platinum and ifosamide, those are acute toxicities that we see with hearing loss, renal tubular injury, you know, some of which will persist in hearing loss almost universally. It's irreversible in our patients. Uh, for, but for treatment modalities like radiation, brain radiation, or neck radiation, some of these effects are so much more delayed in months to years in presentation with cognitive deficits or endocrinopathy. 
Now, in the case of uh, specific agents that now have been dose restricted because we know their toxicity profile, like doxorubicin or radiation therapy, we are now trying to understand the natural history of cardiomyopathy and breast cancer and other types of uh, malignancies after these exposures. You know, and we have a lot of follow-up in uh, historically treated cohorts. Now we need to track the more contemporarily treated cohorts where the, eight, the doses have been reduced to understand, you know, what is the time frame, what is the latency or time to onset, when do we begin screening, when can we begin our interventions. And uh, again, I can't put enough uh, emphasis on health habits and their influence of risk. You know, if an individual has had pulmonary toxic therapy, such as bleomycin, uh, busulfan, lomustine, carmustine, the nitrosureas, or chest radiation, we know that smoking increases the risk of lung injury, and we're actually beginning to see some definitive data demonstrating the impact of smoking in our survivors uh, and uh, their pulmonary function in our lifetime cohort study at St. Jude. I think this is one of the most important studies that has been published from the uh, Childhood Cancer Survivor Study uh, uh, last year. And this is looking at the contribution of chronic health conditions to uh, the development of heart failure. So again, in this group, this is from the legacy cohort of CCSS where there were over 10,000 survivors contributing data. And they wanted to look at uh, the specific uh, impact on treatment exposures to uh, a comorbid uh, cardiovascular condition and is the risk simply additive. And so here, if an individual had hypertension but no anthracycline injury, their, uh, their rate ratio for uh, uh, congestive heart failure was 34-fold. Anthracycline but no hypertension was 8-fold. Okay, but if you, if you looked at the individuals who had hypertension and anthracycline exposure, you know, on almost 90-fold uh, excess risk, uh, and the relative excess risk due to the interaction of this very common comorbid condition, hypertension, to cardiotoxic exposure was almost 45-fold. So we definitively showed in the study hypertension potentiates anthracycline-associated risk for congestive heart failure. And in, in the same study, the, and the citation is here, they model similarly dyslipidemia, obesity, and it really provides compelling data that I share with my survivors as I'm seeing them in clinic to say this is very important for you to, to be working more closely with your primary care provider and getting these other uh, traditional risk factors controlled. Uh, so prevention is extremely important within this population. Even when survivors are doing everything well and they have not developed any chronic health conditions and they maybe have a healthy lifestyle too, we do need to consider and be uh, uh, discussing with survivors at our follow-up visits their family history because genes and family history may influence risk for some of these conditions and we need to be anticipating them based on the history that they're sharing for, with us. Now, attained age does influence risk too and we've been seeing this pattern across multiple cohorts that the, our, some of these cancer treatments appear to produce a clinical picture of accelerated aging. And so many of these conditions that are reported in high prevalence in pediatric cohorts typically are diagnosed in older populations, cognitive and neurosensory deficits, heart failure and heart valve disorders, pulmonary dysfunction, ovarian failure, and cancer. So let me again show you the issue of uh, why this might be the case in, uh, with the normal ovarian reserve. Again, women are born with the highest follicle count, they actually have it in utero, and then at menarche and across the reproductive lifespan, that follicle count declines, okay, until they have menopause, they reach menopause. A cancer uh, experience will uh, reduce that period, reduce the antral follicle count, and abbreviate their period of, of potential fertility when they go through early menopause. So we've seen this aging pattern in uh, our survivors, and so it's very important for us to consider that. And actually within the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, uh, they were able to characterize the group that was highest risk for this complication. 8% of women in the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study uh, had a non-surgical premature menopause. This occurred approximately 30% of those treated with abdominal pelvic radiation therapy plus alkylators, you know, a big high risk for depleting uh, more uh, uh, antral follicles, and the independent risk factors in this group were advancing age, increasing radiation dose to the ovaries, increasing dose of alkylators, and a diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma. So, you know, our understanding and tracking of survivor cohorts can characterize that profile and help you anticipate and, you know, provide an intervention if they are concerned, if they have a limited period of fertility, have appropriate planning, family planning, or, you know, be proactive about fertility preservation measures if they decide to delay childbearing. Okay, so let's go on to another tool to optimize uh, uh, transition of survivorship care, and that's evidence-based practice guidelines, or 
consensus-based practice guide, guidance if you don't have you know, the typical data to do or high quality uh, data to do evidence-based practice guidelines. And so I've just showed you that the majority of childhood and adults diagnosed with cancer are going to become long-term survivors. We know that our treatments predispose to excess morbidity that increases the risk of early mortality. And we have all this information and tracking survivor outcomes, you know, over the last 40, 50 years that allows us to link a late effect with a specific treatment exposure so we can anticipate the health risks. And so we really feel, uh, those of us that are in uh, health outcomes research, that health screening and surveillance will provide this opportunity for prevention, for early detection, and interventions that may preserve that survivor's health. And so survivors and providers need this kind of guidance to be proactive about cancer-related health risks. Now, if you're thinking about guidelines in the scheme of the U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force, or, you know, or uh, other government agencies, when they do a guideline, they want to look at high quality evidence from randomized controlled trials that will link an intervention such as screening and early detection with reduction in mortality. We will never, ever, ever be able to accomplish that in our survivor population. Our numbers are too small. Our outcomes are many years after exposure, you know, when uh, individuals have long since left the, the population. But we have these very strong signals in, uh, you know, in our research showing the exposures and the, and the late effects. So what we did uh, within the children's oncology group and what other groups have done is we looked at the evidence linking late effects with therapeutic exposures. It allowed us to identify high-risk groups. And then our screening recommendations have been based on expert clinical experience, trying to balance benefits of screening and the harms and risks of screening, but match the magnitude of risks with the intensity of screening. And so this is a hybrid model that pediatric groups have used, and here's uh, uh, some uh, examples of guidelines that have been published uh, and disseminated from uh, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network, from the UK uh, ALL group, uh, from COG, and from the Dutch COG. And so these are important resources, but we realized as all of us were doing our individual guidelines, in various countries that we really were not optimizing uh, our guidelines and it was actually confusing because we had some variations on you know what our recommendations were so we decided there would be some benefits to collaborating we reduced duplication of effort effort we could optimize the use of expertise you know with on, with pediatric oncologists with radiation oncologists with pediatric and medical subspecialists coming together and looking at these issues late effects experts individuals who are are trained in doing systematic reviews and meta-analysis and clinical epidemiologists so bringing all that expertise together to unify our guidelines was felt to be very important and a, a good benefit of collaboration and we thought that overall this would improve the quality of survivorship care and it would en enable us to identify the knowledge deficits and research uh, uh, agenda as we move forward so we actually uh, developed the international guideline harmonization process uh, we have a, a, our group now is called the International Late Effects of Childhood Gui Cancer Guideline Harmonization Group. We have a core leadership uh, a group that is uh, supervising the process. We have a standardized research process, uh, and we use breast cancer surveillance as our demonstration project. Uh, we've established harmonization priorities through a, a Delphi survey of late effects experts. We've published our methods, and uh, we have education and training resources available at a website that I'll show you shortly. So our progress now is if you want to look in greater detail, we have a methods paper published. The breast cancer surveillance harmonization has been published in Lancet Oncology. And actually, the cardiomyopathy surveillance uh, is in press and hopefully will be available soon. We have several guideline panels in progress. Uh, some of you in the audience are working on these panels. Uh, and they're addressing female and gonadal toxicity surveillance, thyroid cancer surveillance, and second CNS tumor surveillance. And what is planned uh, for 2015, as we're, we're continuing to increase uh, and expand the number of panels, we'll have expert panels organized in cardiovascular risk and metabolic syndrome, in vascular disease, growth hormone deficiency, uh, neurocognitive outcomes, bone mineral density deficits and osteoporosis, hearing loss, renal toxicity, and GI malignancy. So those are the ones that have been prioritized. And if anyone in the audience is interested in working in any of these groups, please let me know because we're organizing them now and we'll be rolling out. Uh, uh, the work of the group and the scope of what the groups will do in 2015. This is a website. There's some training materials and other information available, so I think you'll have access to the slide set, and please do go explore that because it's, it's meant to be available for everyone. 
Now, let's talk about models of care, this comprehensive multidisciplinary care infrastructure that I know varies uh, regionally and nationally, uh, but pretty much for most, when an individual uh, has a diagnosis of cancer, you are referred to a cancer center, you know, uh, or uh, a, at least a cancer practice, and you have this very intense interventions and interaction with the cancer center. Uh, at diagnosis, during therapy, and shortly after therapy. But at some point, by the time long-term follow-up is, uh, is achieved in sustained remission, pediatric cancer survivors will go back to community follow-up, at least for their primary care. If you're in a center where there's a specialized long-term follow-up clinic, they may have access to these clinics, but these are typically consultation clinics. They're not providing primary care. In some of these uh, regions, there is uh, the opportunity for shared care, which we're going to talk about in greater detail. And there's other places that have different models where they're actually doing more disease-based follow-up. Uh, this is more in the adult arena. But we know that uh, practicalities are going to lead our survivors to go back to their, and it's appropriate, they should go back to primary care. Okay, so let's talk about this models of survivorship care. If you're in a cancer center long-term follow-up program, it's been the backbone of care for pediatric survivors. They see a limited number of uh, a limited number of these programs will actually see adults. They typically have to uh, dismiss them. They're consultations only. They're invariably based at a children's hospital or a cancer center. Uh, there's typically a multidisciplinary team that addresses both medical and psychosocial issues. The core components of these programs are giving that survivor a care plan and delivering risk-based care, that assessment of what their health risks are, uh, and particularly based on their previous treatment. And these are important venues, too, for research and training of healthcare professionals, and it's, important, it's an important venue for us to continue to track outcomes of our survivors as they're aging. Now, another model is uh, the community long-term follow-up care. It's geographically and financially more accessible to patients. It integrates survivor care and primary care, which is important. So that this in these practices, they're going to focus more on primary care at health education. There'll be less focus on cancer-related health education. And in fact, their cancer-related health education or their cancer-related Focus, uh, survivor focused care is going to be dependent upon that provider knowing what to do or the survivor knowing and advocating for that type of evaluation, which can be hit or miss from what we've understood in tracking cohorts. This is important because it supports the independence of young adult survivors who really do need to be uh, managed in the community, but it poses challenges to us because we lose those survivors and we lose an opportunity to track outcomes. So what has been recommended as the optimal care is this survi shared survivorship care. There's follow-up in a cancer center uh, for a period of time that may vary per patient, but typically, you know, at, 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 in pediatric age ranges, most are able to follow them until 18 to 21. Uh, and then there's a transition to the community. There's ongoing contact at that time with community providers, continuous availability of the cancer center team. It provides services to larger number of survivors and potentially is more cost effective than cancer center follow-up and it helps maintain that link to the cancer center that will help us monitor late health outcomes and look for other signals as the populations are aging. Now why is shared survivorship care important in the context of reintegrating the PCP? Well actually we have there are studies now that demonstrate very well that cancer and non-related non-cancer related preventative services are much more likely to be up to date for cancer survivors if they're followed by both an oncologist and a primary care physician. Most of these studies have been done in a, a survivors of adult onset cancer, but it's just you have to consider it in the context if they're back at the cancer center, it's all about the cancer typically, versus if they're in a primary care uh, practice, they're going to be thinking about other more general things that they should be doing in the context of a global health evaluation. Um, also, the transition of care from pediatric to adult focused care is, is a necessity, so we need to be anticipating this and taking advantage of how we can optimize this reintegration of the PCP. And so here's a study, it, it is from a, a study of breast cancer survivors, but it illustrates a point. Uh, if you are looking at the comparison of health maintenance in breast cancer survivors, and if you consider if there was neither a PCP or an oncologist following, or a PCP only, or an oncologist only, or both a PCP and oncologist, and look at, you know, in relation to uh, the general types of uh, evaluations you should be having for preventative care, you have an optimal uh, uptake of those procedures when 
individuals are followed concurrently, in most cases, uh, by the PCP and the oncologist. So we need to work in trying to incorporate these models so it can optimize uh, our outcomes of our survivors and their access to the appropriate screening, both cancer-related, survivor-focused, but also for general preventative health care. Okay, I, I'd like to uh, end by talking about the survivorship care plan and its importance in defining roles of providers within an available model of care. Because I think there is some confusion and difference. Uh, you know, I even asked here, do you do the primary care or do they go back to their PCP? And it's certainly very different uh, within the United States. Most cancer-related uh, follow-ups are not doing primary care. Uh, so the care plan is very important. The care plan is a personalized document for the, for, typically from an oncology clinician it's an oncology clinician's responsibility uh, to provide this to the primary care provider. It has a summary of the cancer history and treatment. It has a primary cancer surveillance plan. So in our long-term survivors, this is less of an issue. You're, you, you quit surveilling at a certain time point. It does have a, a, a delineation of cancer and cancer treatment-related health risks, the subsequent cancer and late effect screening that are appropriate to those treatments, uh, exposures that survivor had the importance of uh, delineation of lifestyle impact on cancer-related risk, the screening for and management of comorbid conditions, and then a definition of the roles of involved providers. So there's a big concern in the U.S., particularly in survivors of adult onset cancer, how do you coordinate this uh, and who you want to be sure that there's not a duplication of effort and that people are doing the appropriate screening and, you know, that people don't drop the ball and forget to screen or they're not over screening or doing dual screening. So this will help delineate that information. And the care plan also should provide information about resources to address medical and psychosocial needs. And so there's a variety of survivorship resources, and again, very regionally, but even if that survivor you know, is not getting primary care uh, within the cancer center, this resource list can be provided to them. And uh, invariably in our clinic, it's the psychosocial resources that are most important to our survivors that, that are struggling with access to care. So here's a care plan in defining roles and responsibilities. Ideally, the oncologist would plan the cancer therapy, manage acute and subacute uh, treatment effects and the primary cancer surveillance, and provide guidance uh, about the long-term survivorship care, all the time keeping the PCP uh, informed, and then facilitating that transition to primary care and remaining available in case new issues arise. The PCP, you know, should uh, concurrently be addressing survivors' physical and emotional needs, overseeing the management of chronic uh, disease feasible in the primary care setting, keeping the oncologist informed, referring for uh, problems and, and, or, and or periodic evaluations, and then consulting. So it's ongoing communication, and these uh, communication has just not been optimal, at least within the U.S. healthcare system. So we are really working to uh, determine what can we do to enhance communication, enhance uh, access to information to our survivors and our providers at point of care. Okay, so uh, I hope from this discussion, uh, these are the take-home points that you have appreciation now that pediatric cancer centers uh, survivors represent a growing and medically vulnerable population. Uh, Long-term and late effects experienced by survivors reduce quality of sur survival and in some cases increase the risk for premature mortality. And the risk of specific long-term and late effects in an individual survivor is related directly to the specific cancer treatments and mediated by a variety of factors. So you really have to know those details and these other factors that can uh, influence risk like age of treatment, gender, genes, behavior, comorbid health conditions, uh, aging, all those need to be considered as you're uh, determining your risk assessment and your screening uh, recommendations. Risk-based survivor care that incorporates routine health care, preventative health care that should be done by a community practice, and a personalized plan of surveillance and screening, as well as the management and prevention of late effects that are predisposed by cancer and its treatment is recommended for all survivors. And so this is what we strive for, recognizing that this sometimes is a tall order to achieve outside a, a long-term follow-up program. And to really do this effectively, knowledge of cancer treatment is required to implement this type of risk-based care. And it can't just be the providers. It is, it is going to require survivors to be very engaged uh, with their providers uh, to understand their health risks that are associated with their cancerous treatment and understand the resources and work collaboratively to optimize their health, preserve organ function after uh, these treatments. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.